Hello, and uh, great to see all of you. Back for more Bach, Bach to Basics. This is our next to last day. If any of you got the message that this was our last day, it's not. <laughs> Thursday, day four or five, Bach to Basics, where we're gonna start to tie up some, some loose ends in this preludio to get ourselves ready for the weekend and our recording project, if that's how we're choosing to put a capper on this project. Um, I know I I'm, look like a walking billboard today. Um, you know, you get this you get this shirt once you've done 100 rides on the Peloton. So um, I, can, I can be your coach today. Imagine if you got a shirt for practicing for 100 days. Wouldn't even have to be in a row. If you just practiced for 100 days, you could get a shirt. That'd be pretty awesome. Um, and a big hello to those of you watching on summerbach.com especially. That's our home base for Bach to Basics. If you're seeing me on YouTube or Facebook or I don't know where else you could be seeing me, but if you are, head on over to summerbach.com because that's where you can register for the Bach to Basics free course, download the materials, download this great music that we're playing. I was just playing some Gwen Stefani with Gwen Stefani at the Hollywood Bowl and coming now back to Bach. Um, it's a wild day. <laughs> so happy to see you. We are going to just jump right into today's assignments. Suggested assignments as always. Feel free to follow your own plan and path through the Preludio. Um, my suggested assignments make sure that you hit all the, the trouble spots before we tie it together. So, <clears throat> starting today with those, those chords, that section just near the end. Figuring out how best to, to navigate that. So whether it's a three note or a four note chord, the guidelines are the same. You're gonna start with the bow on the lower two strings of the chord. You're going to finish with the bow on the upper two strings of the chord. So if we're talking about a four note chord, there's only one possibility for which four strings it's going to be, right? Um, well, there's one possibility on the violin and one possibility on the viola. So we start on the lower two and on the upper two. And just as a reminder, right, that doesn't mean that we're taking our arm from the G string all the way to the E string note because we've got those double stop arm levels and going just to here. So even for a four note chord, you can see it's really only that much motion. So that's important to know. Many people start on a single string. There may be times when you want to do that, but generally, especially when it's a quicker roll, start on two strings, end on two strings. And uh, I also see folks going too far and then having to come back. I'm going to talk about this in a second with three note chords too, but when you play a double stop, you need a little bit more uh, pressure weight in the string as compared to a single string. So if you try and use the same arm weight on a single string as you do for a double stop, you're going to crush the sound. So when folks go too far, rolling this way, and they end up on the top string alone, that's the string that takes the least pressure anyway. And now you're putting double stop pressure on it. So only go to that double stop level. Too much to ask for an in tune double stop there. Three note chord, starting on the lower two strings, finishing on the upper two, which means that that middle string, you've got that in common, right? So, so if I'm on my lowest three strings on the violin, G, D, and A, that means that D string is in common. I never leave that string. In fact, there's gonna be a brief instant, isn't there, when I'm only on that string. 
the longer that moment lasts, the more dangerous it is because, again, single string, um, I might crush the sound, right? So that's something I hear sometimes with three note chords, particularly on the upper three strings. You hear that little moment, stale moment in the middle where I crush the sound a bit, the pitch goes down. So instead I want to be efficient with that roll. I don't want to try to do it so fast or so hastily that I get a bump. Although there may be chords that I want to accent the top, and generally I don't, so... That's well worth practicing, just to build more awareness for where those double stop levels are. So, <clears throat> if you're looking at the text of the assignments we've practiced on the four open strings, Look at straight bow, all right? If I'm, sometimes it's hard with the camera angles. Let me, uh, all right, something like this. <laughs> straight bow here. I'm on the lower two strings. You know my hand. Remember that the path of the arm, let's say, the path of the arm is not exactly the path of the bow. Right, what my arm does to make a straight bow is something like this. So the arm moves back and then a little forward. So that is not a straight path. <laughs> Yet, that's what happens for the bow to go straight. And I know this, by the way, if I want to do this little experiment, if I put the bow straight at the tip, if you want to have some carpet under you or an assistant or something. I'm going to hold the tip where it is now and I'm going to move my bow hand up and down the stick, keeping all the fingers and the thumb in contact with the stick. Look at what my arm is doing. Okay? And yet that is going to produce the straight bow. On the G string, Boy, that arm really feels like it's moving out away from my body, right? Out and away. On the E string, it's much closer to the body. That's just the way it works. I don't need to feel like I'm <laughs> bowing out so much there. That's because of the curve of the bridge, right? The curve of the bridge, curve of the fingerboard. I mention this in the context of chords because if I start with a straight bow here and then roll and keep that same outward path, I've gotten crooked. Instead, when I roll, I'm going to feel like I'm rolling and allowing that arm to come in a little bit. It's subtle, but it just follows the curve of the bridge. It allows me to keep a similar contact point and a straight bow. That's the point of the straight bow. So, the speed of the roll. I could play a four note chord, but <laughs> most chords um, have a melodic element, right? Often the melodic uh, element is the top note, or maybe it's the top two notes. And so if I take so long to roll, then I have no bow left for the top. Should I roll about halfway down the bow? Maybe. How about for this chord in the Bach? Remember our rhythm is... So it's a uh, one and... So if I roll halfway down the bow, it's okay, I still feel like that note gets stale, like I'm having to save the bow. I'd rather finish the roll about a third of the way down the bow so that I'm up top here. Same with the three note. Finish it about a third of the way down the bow. So that's what I'm going to be aiming for in my practice. Finishing that roll, reaching the top strings about a third of the way down the bow.
that's how we come into these chords. So let's get the left hand fingers down as early as I can. Bow's still here. But I've got these fingers down. That's important because I can't play the chord till those fingers are down. Getting the one on the G. And here, covering the fifth. So that I don't have to move that one. That's all excellent chord hygiene there. All right, <clears throat> looking next at Dig Deep. And this idea of preparing lower string fingers early, you know. For some reason, it's always a little bit more natural to prepare fingers when we're on our way up or to prepare fingers on a higher string, but there's something that feels a little backward about preparing a finger on the lower string, and yet it's so important to do um, in many cases when we want to play uh, cleanly, when we don't want to have to wait. For our left hand. So bar 119, um, there's a series that asks us to do this a few times. Let's take a look at that bar. There are my bar numbers. We're coming into this. Yeah. Going from the A string or perhaps even the E, depending on your fingering, down to the bottom string. So a lot of people will put spaces in there because they've got to wait for their left hand, right? Instead, see how quickly my two went down to the lowest string. Now I don't have to wait for the left hand. If I want to take time anywhere, it's going to be on the low note itself, because that's our, our five, right? Our B is the five uh, chord for our one, which is E. That's the violin keys anyway, so... Really hammer it home for the listeners. Um, it's far less effective if, if, I, if I'm having to wait before the B. Right? That just sounds lopsided. So there's a technical reason. I don't want to have to wait for the rhythm, but more importantly, a musical reason that I want to get those fingers prepared early. And, whoops. Oh, I'm sorry wrong application here. Um, and now the only thing to remember about that, and this is always funny, uh, a lot of times I'll be working with someone and they really get this concept um, and they start doing it so well that their bow wants to imitate. And so they get the left hand there early, but then the bow goes early too, which defeats the whole purpose, but it's kind of funny. It, it shows they're really getting the concept. Of... So let the bow wait. Um, that's why we're doing that early in the left hand in the first place, and then enjoy being able to hold on to that low note a little bit um, for the big five. And as I mentioned in the text to yet another example of technical timing, an early left hand being different from the musical timing, which is when we want that note to actually sound. Um, fast and curious the next assignment. Um, this refers to the fact that a lot of the chord changes in this piece, because the tempo is very fast anyway, um, it's enough <laughs> to have one chord change per bar. 
um, and sometimes a chord will last over several bars. There are a few places, however, where the chord changes happen more frequently, um, as often even as every beat, which is, you know, chord, chord, chord. That's very fast indeed. And not only are those places a little bit tricky, actually for both hands, um, and so deserving perhaps of a little time in that respect, but I, I'm never I'm never that satisfied if to have to slow something down just for technical reasons. There is a musical reason too, and it's just that our listeners, you know, they don't know about these twists and turns. So you know, just as when you're driving on a road and there are literal twists and turns, you slow down to take those turns. You can do the same thing in a subtle way, and it makes musical sense because it lets our listeners process those changes. If they just blow right by, then they're actually less effective. So I'm speaking first of bars 93 to 96. Um, let's see what that sounds like. Let's get into it just a little bit um, from 89. And when I get to 93, You'll hear I'm going to slow it down more than I will in performance, but you can hear the chords change. So this is 90. In fact, so far the chord hasn't changed at all. It's still that C sharp 7 chord. Even in 93, you know, I I said that the section starts in 93, but even there, we still have the same C-sharp chord. And then we're, then we're back to the less frequent changes, but this... the first note of each four, starting in 94. Bach, there's never anything lost <laughs> in Bach, never anything unimportant. Um, and this is a movement where, with the exception of those chords that we, that we started today with, we're only ever playing one note at a time, and yet he manages to create these different voices. So this is this is basically what the continuo, what the, the bass might be playing if we had accompaniment for this. More on that in a moment. But um, if you hear how it resolves, I like to relax a little bit into those downbeats and lean on the. lean on the second beats because those have the most harmonic tension. So let's, let me play it now in tempo. Um, I'll get into it from the same spot, 90. So I wouldn't say that that sounds slow. It just gives people a chance to maintain their bearings. It's, it's an exciting ride. Again, you know, to, to make the exact parallel to an actual ride, um, if you're on a roller coaster, if you're on any sort of amusement park ride, when you're getting jerked around and it's, you know, actually twisting and turning or bumping or whatever it's doing, at those moments, you don't actually still have to have a lot of forward speed for it to be exciting. It's that circular or, you know, back and forth motion or, or <laughs> bumping motion that provides the excitement. So the speed can slack off in such moments, even in a ride. Um, the, excuse me, the other part I wanted to look at in the same way is 106 
to 108. Let's just hear what that sounds like as well. I'll play one bar earlier, so 105. Here's 106. So look, if you would, at bar 106, the first note of every four again, starting with the second beat. Descending fifths, right? So it's a different chord on every beat, descending fifths pattern. Uh, now one of them is not a perfect fifth, right? From so we've, uh, but it's in the violin anyway, it's a B to an E to an A. So let me play from 102 and you'll hear um, how by the time I get to 106, I'm just gonna pull it back a bit so that you can feel that series. So this is 101. And that arrival, that's kind of a, a checkpoint there, and so I'm going to ease into that anyway. So it just makes sense to spread those tricky bars. One more time. And then you can let it go again. So always a musical reason for time taking. There, uh, one of the great joys in life uh, is to want to take time for a purely technical reason, but to make up a musical reason for why, why that should happen. It's so great in a string quartet. Um, <laughs> I've, I've been caught doing this. It's, it's a lot of fun to catch someone else doing it too, you know, where they say, okay, I, you know, we should really take time into letter C. And, you know, someone else will say, oh, really? Because I, I, I feel like the rhythm, the, the harmony really drives toward there. Oh, I know, but um, I, I just think that, that it would sound really good to j just delay that downbeat a little bit. Ha, huh. because the, then finally they're like, all right, I've got a big shift there. <laughs> okay, or all right, I'm crossing strings there and I need a moment. <laughs> and uh, yeah, everybody's been caught from time to time. It's like the conductor making a mistake, screwing up a, you know, a meter and then stopping and saying, all right, all right, all right. Um, horns, I think you were a little bit late there. Um, the great conductors always admit when that's what they're doing. Let's get back to assignments. Um, I promised you more on this sort of hidden baseline stuff. So at a time when I may have said this before in, in our live sessions, but I know in the emails that I've sent around this, I mentioned there was a long time <laughs> that nobody played this music, um, at least in public. Bach didn't perform it that we know of. In fact, we don't know that anyone performed um, any of these during his lifetime. Um, manuscript survived. It's not as though it was lost or anything. Um, but people tended to look on, on these pieces as sort of studies, etudes maybe, um, some pieces that, you know, hinted at the possibilities of what the instrument could do, but that weren't especially practical to actually perform. You know, they were considered not only very difficult, but just not that satisfying sounding, a single violin, you know, trying to play polyphony, multiple voice stuff. Um, and I think it's because it's not as though other composers hadn't written virtuosic pieces with double stops and I mean, we just look at Paganini uh, and any, I mean, Vivaldi, uh, 
Locatelli for anyone who did the first violin picks. <laughs> um, but those pieces, the, the double stops were always for brilliant effect. And so much of the Bach solo sonatas and partitas, there was real counterpoint there. And that's something different. That, that's a lot harder to pull off in any kind of satisfying way. Um, so people didn't play it. And it took, you know, Felix Mendelssohn with the orchestras that he led as conductor leading sort of a popular revival of Bach's music. Hard to imagine a time when orchestras didn't play Bach, uh, but there was such a time. Um, and then it took even a little bit longer for violinists to start playing and performing these solo sonatas and partitas. So all of this is to say that Robert Schumann, who not only was a great composer, but virtuoso pianist, music critic, um, he decided to give Bach a little helping hand, and for some of the solo sonatas and partitas, including this entire E major partita, he wrote an accompaniment. Um, so not just a bass line, but a keyboard accompaniment in two hands. And it is fascinating to look at the choices he made with this preludio. Um, some of them are pretty obvious, um, and some not at all obvious. and. You know, I, I'm not going to say that he improves the piece or that this piece needs accompaniment because it doesn't, but it's really great to just look at this score. You can find that on M IMSLP, the Robert Schumann um, version of this E major partita. And I mentioned it in the context of these tricky spots where the chords change all the time, because when you look at those spots, you can see in the bass line quarter notes, because that's when the chords are changing. So. Take a look at that, um, and you, you can even listen to various recordings of it. A lot of fun when you're on a practice break from trying to learn the violin version. Um, <clears throat> memory spot. Depending on how intent you are on memorizing this music, you know, memory challenges can take different forms, right? There's a sort of mental stamina. We're going to get to stamina in just a bit the act of, you know, playing a lot of notes in a row, it just takes mental energy and takes practice and repetition. And in that case, you might not know exactly where your brain might decide to have a senior moment. Um, but then there are those specific spots where it's a pretty clear, you could go this way or you could go that way. And when you know what those spots are in advance, uh, you can plan for them. And we've got one of them, there's 55, and there's 123, so let's just look at what those places are. 55 goes like this, etc. 123. So, if you take the wrong one the first time around, uh, you turn this into a you know minute and a half long piece instead of four minutes. Um, so what can you do? Because we've got two virtually identical bars. Now the first one does start on, on a low note. Second one starts up here. So where is the difference? It's in the next bar, right? So first time around. Second time around, a um, couple different ways you can go about this. One is kind of, um, I call it cheap and easy, but it is very effective. The first time around you play a one, the second time around you play a three. One comes before three, and I will admit to you that to this day, that's the way I remember it. Um, and I don't think I've yet made that mistake in performance. I've forgotten a lot of other things in this preludio. That's one wrong turn I don't think I've yet taken. Um, now, a better way would be to have a harmonic understanding, to know where you're going, 
so that even if you stumbled on a little step, you'd st it's not like you'd wander off in a completely wrong direction. You'd stumble, but then you'd be like, okay, well, I'm the first time around going for that E7 chord. You could play anything and still end up there. Whereas the second time around, we're, this is near the end, so we're on our big five. On our way to the home key. So the second time around, we... We're in the middle of a series. So, you know, those two places should feel very different harmonically. Um, and that would be a more mature and sophisticated way to uh, keep your bearings. I have always relied on the cheap and easy way. Um, now that I've said that, I'm sure the next time I play this, it's gonna, yeah, it's gonna come back to bite me. I will say I had the chance to play some solo Bach, uh, not this movement, but um, the G minor sonata adagio and fugue for for a small, uh, but small and sympathetic group of folks, and you know, I hadn't tested out my memory stuff yet on my own, uh, which is usually <laughs> something that's good to do. Um, you know, if I haven't performed it from memory, it's different from just playing it by yourself in the practice room from memory. If I haven't performed it from memory in a while, I usually like to really go back over it and figure out all the different memory stuff that could happen and then present it. This time, I didn't have a chance to do that. So I thought, yeah, should I use the music just to be safe? And but, eh, I know this one. And uh, sure enough, I get partway through and I can see it coming a couple bars in advance. I, I get that, that, that thought that you hate to have, which is like, huh, how, how do I know what's coming next? Is this all just, am I running on fumes? Like what, what would happen if I just forgot the next chord? Boom. And then I forgot the next chord. But to my surprise, I had a harmonic understanding and I fumbled for a few beats, but I knew exactly where I was going to end up. And so I ended up there and I thought, wow, this must be what it's like to, to live like Bach or Mozart or Beethoven for five seconds. You know, any of those truly great improvisers who could find their way out of any gym. Um, I've heard stories from famous, famous performers playing Bach where they, <laughs> um, Roster Povich supposedly um, once played a, it was like a 15 minute version of a Bach movement that should have taken five minutes just because he kept going around in circles and making things up and going to this little dead end and that little dead end, but he never stopped playing and eventually he found the place he was going to go. It just took three times longer than it was supposed to. <laughs> um, all right. stamina test. So it's time to see where we are, where you are, in terms of this whole piece. And there may be some guesswork involved, because if you haven't, you know, if this is your first time learning this music and you haven't performed it yet, you might not know what your performance tempo is going to be. Let's say you're going to make a recording this weekend. Today's Thursday. You might not know how much faster you can get by Saturday. Um, or you may not be planning on making a recording at all. You're just working your way through this and picking up some new skills and gaining a greater understanding. So if you're going to play this whole thing through, what tempo should it be? And I would advise you, you know, to, to aim a little bit low. Um, it's kind of like running your first marathon, right? Now, Despite the fact that I, you know, wearing the uniform of a fitness coach here, I've never run a marathon. My wife has. And, you know, what's that goal in the first marathon? You know, you probably have some sort of time wish, time goal. But what's the, the number one wish to finish, right? You want to look back and say, you know, I've finished a marathon. I've done it. And with this, if you haven't played this through before, it's so satisfying to do, even if you miss this and that, and even if you're tired at the end, 
just to get through it to be okay. So for that reason, take a click off the tempo. Um, if there's one section that's kind of holding everything up, uh, you know that you always have to play slower than the rest. I'm a little bit torn as far as whether to tell you, okay, well then you've got to play the entire movement at that slower tempo so that it's all the same. I think with this kind of a project where we're not aiming for perfection in five days, you could pick a tempo that's more in the middle so that even if that section's kind of messy, um, you've got a pretty good idea of what your, what your basic performance tempo is going to be. But let's play it through. We can even do that together now. I'd, I'd love another chance to, to play this through. I'm going to take a click off the tempo myself, exaggerate the shapes a little bit. Um, and what I'm going to pay attention to and what I want you to pay attention to, you could even take this opportunity for yourself if you want to mute me and play it through as I play it through. What we're going to pay attention to is that stamina, that energy aspect, tension. How do we feel at the beginning? How do we feel by the middle? How do we feel at the end? If we're just exhausted and dead, our hand is dead, our bow arm is dead at the end of the piece, then we need to do some detective work. Um, is there a point during the movement where we can start to feel like, okay, I'm running out of gas or yikes, I'm really holding on to a lot of tension here. Because that's important information to learn, and you can't really learn it until you play the whole thing through. Um, when you're working on this piece in sections, all the sections might feel nice on their own. But when you put them together, you realize, oh, well, this was fine at the first part of the day. But when I've played the whole rest of the piece before it, then it's a problem. So let's take the opportunity to do that now. Beauty of sound, ease, um, and since I don't have any page turn pedals, uh, I'm going to have to do this from memory as it turns out. So, good test for me. Hopefully I make it. <laughs> like Paula says, uh, Nathan Violin Karaoke. I don't have a little bouncing ball. For you to follow. So I'm going to play it about this tempo. Don't worry if your tempo is slower or faster than that. Um, this is a way for me to relax a little bit, to exaggerate shapes.
It's like that, uh, that nice warm-up run that ends up, uh, <laughs> you tell yourself you're going to go out easy. You go out easy for a while, and then it's like... <laughs> um, no, I think I managed to keep a click off the, off the tempo most of the way there. And feeling pretty good. It's interesting. Um, the place where I started feeling a little gassed, the place I didn't expect, um, the... By that point, um, I felt a little bit flagged. So if I look at what came right before that, I might get a little clue um, as to what was happening there. So that is bar 63 that st starts all that bariolage. And I wonder if it was actually the section from 43 to 55 where I was maybe holding on to a little bit too much tension or else moving the bow arm too much. The... For example, I may have forgotten to release my first finger. I may have been... Um, which will add tension in a hurry. I'd have to go back and watch the, watch the replay to, to be sure, um, which I'm not going to do now can't anyway since this is live. So, you know, that's the kind of detective work I might do. Um, another thing that can contribute to tension, right, is just <laughs> playing forte or fortissimo for two lines in a row. Uh, that's especially why I wanted to exagger exaggerate the shapes in this run so that I would know, you know, just solidify what my plan was going to be. Um, I keep going away from the right app here. So, you know, now we're at the point where you can start planning that recording, you know, even to the point of picking which day, which time you might want to set aside to do it. My general strategy for these things is to just do three runs of the piece and that's it. Pick my favorite one or pick the one I hate the least and, you know, choose that one as the sort of capstone of the project. I could share it. I know this is a martini shaker, but this is a not a not a giant martini. I could share it. We talked about, you know, possibly uploading it to YouTube and sharing the link only with members of the Bach to Basics community, showing it only to family and friends, keeping it for ourselves, and of course, simply not making a recording at all. There's no, no pressure, no pressure except peer pressure. Um, no, not even that in our friendly community. So, but I would put it on the calendar. Um, if you know there's a good time this weekend, how long does it take to play this piece through three times? after setting up your smartphone as your camera, setting up the, you know, you could use your, if you have a notebook computer, probably has a little webcam built in, you could use that as well. It'd take me 15 minutes, so I'd want to take a few minutes break in between the runs. So call it a half hour. Call it an hour if you like to take longer water breaks. It's all you'd need to get one of these recorded. And then, you know, not only would it give you something to look back on, I call the assignment something to remember me by, but it's also great information for you to know. Here are the, look, there are 30 assignments, 30 odd assignments um, that we did or that we will have done on this preludio by the end of the week, by the end of tomorrow. You know, which ones stuck right away? You know, for example, did I never have my one on the string before? And now after just five days of thinking about it, huh, look at this recording I made. That one is actually resting on the string most of the time. And my intonation is better because of it. That's great stuff to know. There might be other things, especially in regards to shaping, where you'll think, yeah, I really internalized this idea of... And then you look at your recording and it goes... 
And you're like, no, 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 I know I was doing that, but there's the video evidence. I can't tell you how many times that happens to me. It's basically every time I make a recording. I'm like, no, 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 I know I did this other thing, but the video doesn't lie. So I highly encourage it. Uh, you don't need fancy equipment, as I said, uh, but today is a great day to just put it on the calendar and then forget about it. You can use the rest of today to just go through the assignments, to start playing longer and longer sections of this through, to pay attention to those places where you may be carrying tension. And at this point, I want to put an eye on the chat to see what questions may come in. And uh, yes, well, Paula, you're, you're there with the great comments. Uh, a martini would help me last through the piece. Um, not in my experience. I've had, you know, never publicly performing, but done some chamber music readings with, with the martini. And um, for about 10 minutes, I think I have great, great chamber music instincts and the perfect vibrato and every, everything. And then I, I realized that it's gone downhill. Um, measure 135, the rhythm. It's a good question because uh, this is actually a rhythm that's often played incorrectly. So let's just check it while we're here. Yeah. It's a great question, actually, and something I forgot to address. It's important to be able to play these bars with metronomic rhythm, even if you're going to deviate from that. And yeah, I actually took a little time. Some people take a lot of time without realizing that that's what they're doing. What these two bars are, 134 and 135, is actually a hemiola. And what that <laughs> sounds like some painful skin condition. Um, it's just, it's a, a three pattern. Uh, I'm sorry, it, it's patterns of two beats inside music that's written in three beats. We've been going one, two, three, one, two. So a hemiola is one, two. One, two, one, two. So in six beats, instead of two groups of three, it's three groups of two. So if you look at bars 134, 135, two. That's kind of the condensed rhythm. And I add a trill there. So if I'm going to play it metronomically, I'm going to fit it in just like that. That makes that first beat of 135 really fast, doesn't it? So most people, when you hear them play it, they're going to take some time. But sometimes they'll do it like that or even slower and they actually play that first beat exactly twice too slow. So I like to still let people hear the hemiola if they can, which means I'm, I'm still going to play that first beat of 135 fast. So great question, and I, I had forgotten to address that, that little hemiola. Um, acceptable tempo on the slow end, that's a great question too. Um, you know, acceptable in the eyes of, in the eyes of who? It's kind of like, um, I, I, I do know what you're asking. I, I know, um, and I've been there. What I would do if, you know, you know the first question to ask is, um, is there, what's the reason uh, not to play a faster tempo? And there may be some good reasons, right? If the reason is my hand isn't developed enough yet to, to play that quarter note equals 90, you know, four or five notes in tune, right? Because I just, I haven't had that experience. I haven't played enough patterns. I don't have practice shifting. Uh, there's so much going on with the bow that I, I just, everything's out of tune. Well, that's a great reason to keep it slower because there's no reason to play a big, you know, difficult piece like this all out of tune. And so when you say acceptable, I'd call it 
better than acceptable, I would call it a great idea to keep things slow and to learn all, these, all this information about your hand, to focus on sound quality in the bow, to, to really explore the music and get to know the music. Now, if the reason is, well, I can't play a faster tempo because, you know, bar 103 uh, always gives me a problem. And because I can't get that faster, I'm going to play the whole thing slower. Then I might say, you know what, let bar 103 go. And if you can play the rest of the thing at a faster tempo, go ahead and do it because it's easier to achieve the character of this music, right, if the tempo is fast. You know, it's marked, um, I didn't have a tempo marking, uh, or even a, a, a descriptive tempo marking, just marked preludio. Um, but we can guess at the character of this music, or, or we can, you know, hit it on the head pretty quickly. It's celebratory, it's certainly virtuosic. He wouldn't have written the burialage stuff if it weren't meant to be. There's a driving element to the rhythm, so it's just easier to get when the tempo is faster. Um, so I think this project is what you want it to be. And it should be fun. Uh, it's certainly going to be challenging no matter what, but uh, we're all going to have different goals with this. So there, there is no low end of acceptability for the tempo. There's also been a question about um, fatigue, when to stop practicing. Uh, you know, pain is... <laughs> that really blinking red light that says stop now and i say that it can be difficult it can be frustrating to know particularly if you're not too experienced to know the difference between fatigue and pain um, and to further confuse the issue is the fact that fatigue if you push if you try to push past it can often lead to pain and injury right so, you know, my advice is if you're feeling pain, stop right away. If you're feeling fatigue, um, you want to really keep an eye on it. Um, if I'm playing this music at a moderate tempo, as I just ran it through for you, and I'm feeling some fatigue part way through, I'm experienced enough to know uh, I'm not on the verge of like breaking down and getting hurt. Um, I know what this feeling is. It just means that, you know, as I explained, there, there's some, maybe I was holding on to a one a little too long. Maybe I was moving the bow a little bit too much, but none of the motions I'm making are new to me. Um, if you're trying a lot of new things, you're going to get fatigued uh, more often and more quickly. So pay attention to where it is. Um, take more frequent breaks. And... Um, you know, massaging after is a great thing to do if you have whatever method it is. It can be as simple as just kind of, you know, <laughs> rolling out, pushing out some of these tendons there. If you've got a foam roller, that can be a nice thing or like a massage stick. Um, I've got something called a Theragun that I'll use from time to time. Um, I had a a lot of playing to do last night, and when I came back home, I thought, you know what, I better get out that Theragun and just break things up in there. And um, everybody's got their own methods, but the, the best one is not to let it go so far um, that extreme measures are, are needed. Yeah. A um, couple more questions before we... Uh, now, Leonard asks... Uh, about the you, you can see the benefit of holding the first finger down but find it creates a lot of extra tension in your left hand well so yeah remember that it doesn't always need to be down solidly as if you were playing a note with the first finger um, it can be resting on the string or you know as a last resort can be resting above the string but in its place you know more important than the one actually being on the string is just knowing where your one is because too many people get in the habit of, you know, they play one finger at a time and then the other fingers could be doing whatever. So it's just a great habit to know where your one is. So start really, really light. And that's one of those things too where the muscles will probably adapt as you get more used to it. Um, but right, if you're feeling tension with that, take breaks, shake it out. 
Um, Paula, question about musical interpretation, told in college to be very Baroque and to avoid overdoing romantic interpretations. Yeah, is, is too much romantic tacky in Bach? I can't help but play Bach like Brahms. You know, you'd be in great company if you did so. Um, th there's always a pendulum with this stuff, right? Um, the recordings we have of people from the early part of the 20th century playing Bach, most of them are quite romantic. Um, and I would say that that continued at least until the middle of the 20th century. And then there was a start of a swing back until, you know, by the 70s, 80s, a lot of people were staying as far away from that as they could. Um, now, I don't even know where the pendulum is now. <laughs> you hear all sorts of interpretations. You know, it has to be satisfying to you in order for it to be satisfying to your listeners. So you have to find something that speaks to you, that's compelling to you. Um, and if you're aesthetic, and I think you use that word to, yeah, how does Nathan feel aesthetically about that? You know, if your aesthetic tends toward the romantic, it, it's pointless to just ignore that. So I think to a certain extent you have to go with it. Um, but it can be fun and illuminating, particularly as you look at other movements in this partita. Um, what do you do for slurs? You know, romantically it might be... Yeah. This from the gavotte to sustain slurs out. So if that's the way you were trained and brought up, you could keep doing that, or you could take this opportunity to say, huh, okay, I know that wouldn't have been possible on the bows they had back then. These slurs would have to taper, at least on the down bow. So let me see, you know, what does that do for the music? And you might find, as I have found, that it actually fits the music quite well in most cases. That doesn't mean just because it fits, that doesn't mean you have to wear it. Um, but it can be a nice thing to try, particularly if, you're, you know, if your income doesn't rely on exactly how you perform this stuff. So I think, I think each of us is free to follow our own muse with that. Um, when you hear me play other movements, it's tough in this one because there aren't that many long notes. But when there are, you heard me vibrate the chords. I do that. Um, and that's a great question to finish on. If there are more, um, don't forget that in the summerbach.com, the Bach to Basics community, we have our great discussion forum. Uh, that's a great place for discussions too. And if there are questions that come up over and over, uh, you can be sure that I'll get to them in our last live session tomorrow as well. So take lots of breaks, set your recording day and time on the calendar. Uh, yes, get your favorite beverage ready for afterward. And we've got one more day of live time together and a few more assignments. So thanks so much for joining me. If you haven't already registered at summerbach.com, go take care of that, join the fun, join the community. I'll see you tomorrow, same time. Thanks so much, bye.